Oh. Good evening. <clears throat> I experimented last time with turning down the latency, but we'll see. We'll just leave it at what it is now. <clears throat> All right. Well, hopefully everyone's having a good day um, and, uh, and is ready. Uh, this will be, the, I guess, the last time I talk to you before the weekend. So my hope is that you all have a good weekend as well, uh, right? Uh, and uh, hopefully things are going well on exam two. I um, haven't had any any questions on it too much. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is I want to address uh, the idea of our schedule. So I, I want to give you a revised schedule for the rest of the semester, and then uh, and and. A, I don't know, we, there's no, I guess there's no talking about it in an asynchronous way. So, um, I mean, if you have any concerns, email them to me or otherwise. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, maybe looking for some other times to do, uh, uh, to do, hmm, think about this. So when we get to the Maria stuff at the end, there's going to be like, uh, well, let me talk about it. Let me bring it up first, and then we'll look at it here. Uh, is this the best way to look at it? Eh, uh, maybe not, but uh, here we go. Let's do a windowed like this. That way I can put it off to the side better. Uh, uh, there. And I can zoom in some. Actually, I can do this. There we go. All right, so this is this will be next week, um, and and so next week we'll start with uh, we'll finish up chapter nine, and then we'll start chapter ten, and then we'll do like an intro to Marie. Although we talked about it before a little bit, I didn't touch on it too much. Uh, but what we'll do is I'll I'll um, I'll find a Marie uh, program, and I'll have you guys be able to uh, download that, and I'll show you how to do that. And then we'll get in, I'll write maybe a, a program or, or something. And so my idea, so for non-theoretical classes, <laughs> um, I do things very, very differently um, in that I know there's a, like a tons and tons of resources out in the world. So um, even on Marie, uh, maybe not quite as much on Marie, but, but, uh, but there is plenty there. And so what I'll do is... I'll, for the most part, I'll just model coding. I'll do something called live coding, although it won't be live. It's going to be weird, but you'll you'll see a little bit of how I do it, and uh, and that'll be similar to how I do things. All right. So then, what we'll do is we'll finish out ten. Oh. Okay, I got an email. I just that's what that Bing was. If you heard it, but you probably didn't, but maybe. Okay, so. Uh, so then we'll finish out 10, which is a fairly sh small chapter, uh, and 10 is on embedded systems, so systems that are inside of things. So like if you had a drone that had a computer in it that wasn't, well, even if it's controlled, um, it's, it's, that would still be considered an embedded system. So... <clears throat> Uh, or, you know, the, the computer that's in, um, let's say, a fridge or uh, your coffee maker. Even though, you know, it's real simple, like if you can program it and, and that, then that's, that's definitely a computer. Or if it just has multiple different buttons, there's a good chance there's a chip in there. So uh, th we'll talk about some of those. Uh, and then we'll get, and then because we're finished this chapter here, we're going to go ahead, I'll do two Maria, uh, Marie um, ones. But what I'm doing here, I'm thinking that I might be looking at alternate times for at least these three Marie sessions. So let me finish talking about the rest of these. So then I'll start 11, but because of Thanksgiving, I don't want, I'm not going to be able to finish it. So we'll just stick a Marie in there, or we'll do no lecture, depending on where we are. If we get a good sense that Marie has been covered well, then uh, then I'll switch that to a no lecture. And for the Marie ones, I, I'll do the screen capture like I have been, but I will not be, um, although I think I'll probably put them in a different playlist. 
but but we'll um, we won't I, I won't do notes right because I'll just have the Marie program up so uh, that just understand that is that there won't be at those the the one note notes um, or the I guess I'm generating them with one note so uh, but then we'll finish out 11 and we'll do that in the week of well we do so we'll, we're going to do three more assignments and then two programs and I, I moved up the exam here this is the finals week um, and if I can't do a program during that week somebody will probably tell me and I'll switch it back but I don't know that that's um, that's a thing uh, so I, I wanted to do the exam first and the program second I thought that I thought that would be better to give you guys a little bit more time there um, and these no lectures here um, if if we need more time I'll certainly do that or I can set up uh, times when I'm just available and so we can either we can do a zoom meeting or something like that where I'm just going to be on the zoom meeting available for you guys to to contact and we can set that up for times alternate than seven o'clock so this maybe seven o'clock doesn't work for you so we'll I'll I'll think on it a little bit I I don't know if anybody has any concerns or any suggestions there um, I guess what I'm thinking is I'll probably move it to five o'clock on each of those days on the no lecture days um, and that'll be time for you guys to get a hold of me if you want to you can just come into the zoom meeting so I'll set up a zoom meeting for that for each of those nights it won't be on YouTube so it won't be recorded so that's that's that um, if there's any questions let me know uh, on on the schedule or how that's all gonna go okay so back to the notes okay there's a lot of stuff to cover today so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to zip zip through it here and uh, and, and we'll see it we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes okay <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about parallel and multiprocessor architectures so first I'm gonna talk about yeah parallel par the parallel computing and there's kind of two different ways to two kind of main ways to think about it um, and then I'll talk about multiprocessors so just because just because it's a multiprocess or a parallel doesn't mean that there's multiple processes going on and and we'll we'll, we'll show I'll show you how that works <clears throat> and there's two two main main ideas in in that so parallel right means that two instructions are being done at the same time from your program now one way to do that is in the same processor uh, and that's actually two ways to do it and we'll talk about those and then otherwise we're talking about multiple processors so it's different uh, the data streams are, are different or the instruction streams are different <clears throat> and we had a kind of an intro when I talked about that that Flynn's took so, yeah Flynn's Notes. Yeah, Flynn takes it out of me. Okay. We'll even get to supercomputers and talk a little bit about how those work different. Actually, you know what I need to do? Is I need to open this up again and... I'm going to print this out so that I have it. There we go. <clears throat> All right. We can get rid of the old one. Okay. So after today, there's only going to be, there'll be six more lectures after today on 
material other than Marie. So, although I will do the Marie ones as well. Okay. All right, so what's the motivation? So, remember when we talked about um, Moore's Law and what Rock's Conjecture or, or Rock's Law that that says it gets more expensive? So, so first off, the Moore's Law, Moore's Law says that that basically uh, it says that computers will can, can do get smaller and faster as time goes along and double every 24 months and and we're continuing to, to try to do that uh, the, but physically that's not possible forever we know that it's it's because you know we're bound by physics and you know the speed of light uh, even if we can do that so so we're, we're bound by that speed on um, that constraint kind of holds us back from going any faster so because of that we need to be able to do things at the same time so so we can simulate going faster even though no single part maybe is going faster uh, so and the other constraint right that we know that physically it can't it can only get so good there is a limit but also um, in Rock's law tells us that eventually it will get so expensive it won't be worth it. So, right, you know, if it's going to cost a billion dollars to get it better and the company's only going to make ten million dollars from that increase, they're probably not going to do it. Although my guess is the gap won't be that big, at least to start with. So, uh, just be aware, you know, that's that's part of the motivation. That's the reason why they started switching and, and going to pushing more of the par parallel architectures. Okay, so so the first thing is, and oh, let's just do it in boxes here. I actually kind of like those. They're a little easier to see. And you don't have to worry about me um, messing up. So the first thing is super pipelining. Pipelining, lining. There we go. Yeah, that's actually spelled correctly. So, actually, let's just do the whole thing here. Put it in that. In that. Okay. Okay. All right. So, this the definition for super pipelining. So we've talked about pipelining before. At, right, and pipelining is where you take, oh, isn't that on the exam? might be on the exam, so I'll leave that for you guys. <laughs> uh, double check, actually. No, okay, it doesn't. Okay, so good, good. All right, so, uh, so, so regular pipelining is. Uh, I didn't remember everything that's in the exam. That's okay. Uh, the uh, regular pipelining is where you break it into usually five, five different sections or stages, and then. Uh, there can be a different instruction in each stage so that instead of having to wait to do all five stages when we get the instruction right decode or the uh, the fetch decode those kinds of things so instead of doing that we can just simply uh, we can have one part of the computer that's just fetching and then fetching and then fetching every single cycle it fetches a new instruction and it just keeps m moving along Right, and that that helps us with the risk. Right, risk helps us with that. Now, the idea for super pipelining is this. So this is it's it's pipelining, but it it has at least well, okay. This is weird. 
Ah, well, that's what happened. Okay, has at least one stage that takes less than half a cycle to complete. And so what this means is, effectively, effectively, that uh, stage can do two instructions per cycle. You might say, well, why does that help us? It doesn't help us at all. Well, true, because, right, well, there's another section, right, that can't uh, do the, the next part of it. Well, right, because we split. So, we, so bad if we can fetch two, two, right, then we'll just have this long queue of fetches. And the decoding can't be, you know, maybe the decoding can't be done as fast. Uh, or at some point, right, one of them is going to be slower. Uh, that's, that's true, but we can use super pipelining actually to combine with other things. And so that's where, that's where it comes in and becomes much more useful. In fact, we can combine it with the next idea. And that's super scalar. So a superscalar or superscalar is a methodology that allows multiple instructions to be executed A methodology that allows multiple instructions to be executed simultaneously in the same cycle. Bah. Okay, but actually, let me give you something maybe kind of effectively, or, or what that really means is what that really means is I can have multiple chunks of, of, uh, of, of on my chip, right, that, that can execute an instruction at the same time. Or I can go and and uh, get you know, two, two addresses out of cache and bring that into a register. I can do that in the same, during the same cycle. So I've got two pieces, uh, so it's like an, adding another lane to the road. <clears throat> so instead of having a single lane road, you can have a two-lane road, or a three-lane road, or a four-lane road, because we could in increase this as many times as we want. Because it, it just says multiple, right? So, you know, effectively, it might be a little harder to work on, uh, but it's possible. And so, uh, and I'll, we'll explain that in a second here. Uh, so this, this comes with the idea of... Um, of, I'm not going to put it on here, but an execution unit. So this execution unit is it's it's either a floating point adder or multiplier, or an integer adder or multiplier, and it's just a specific circuit that's set up to do either of those two things. Sp you know, uh, and then we'll have multiple of them. And one of the main things that we do when we're processing, right, we're either bringing things and storing them over here or loading them from there or whatever. One of the main things that, they, that the computer does is adds and multiplies. And we know that multiplication is just a fancy adding machine. So it really just adds. It also can compare, but that's about it. It, and it just otherwise it's just loading stuff out of memory and putting it into places and com, you know, maybe comparing, maybe adding. That's it. Doesn't do much. Uh, it's just real simple. Um, oh, otherwise, oh, sorry. There, there is another thing. We can also have some other kind of specialized component. 
Uh, so that's what an execution unit is. So it's something that can handle a single stage, a uh, specific single stage, and then we can have those can be the multiples, and those usually are. Okay. Oh, let me go back. Actually, let me come in here. So in, because there's a couple other things. Instruction fetch unit. And I should capitalize it at F. So, whoa, that got weird. So, instruction fetch unit can bring in multiple things at the same time, which is great. So, uh, and it just brings them in and it can hang on to them. Remember, these are more complicated. The superscalar idea is much more complicated. And so uh, it's, it allows for the, but it has to have a specialized fetch unit. It also has a decoding unit. And, and here's the, a specialized decoding unit. And here's the difference. And this is actually really kind of, um, kind of neat. So what this does is it figures out whether or not the all the instructions that just got brought in from the instruction fetch unit, it figures out which of them can be done simultaneously and which ones can't. Because sometimes you can't do things simultaneously, right? So if um, if my computer is is taking a number and then just receiving a, a, a group of numbers, you know, one after another that the user provides on an input and it just adds them all together as it goes, that uh, can't be done simultaneously because you have to ask the user and then and then do the add and then ask the user and then do an add and then ask the user and do an add. So it's, there's not a lot of There, there's really no ability for it to 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 uh, par make that parallel. So I want to uh, point out something here, that super pipelining and super scalar are not the same. They're different things, right? Because the super scalar is executing multiple things at the same time, sometimes on one piece of software or one piece of computer chip, right? Like the instruction fetch unit or the decoding unit, but sometimes in execution units, which are separate. Pipelining is where it's gonna, do, it doesn't do them at the same time. It does one and then it can do another one quick because, right, it didn't use up, it's only used up half the time or less. So it can do two. So you might not have the regular instruction fetch unit although you probably do, uh, because the super pipeline doesn't necessarily help you there. The other thing actually that could happen, and this could be very useful in, in, uh, in pipelining and or in other things, is that we can notice, like, like if, we, if we're 100 instructions ahead on fetching and decoding, fetching and decoding. So we're a hundred ahead 
Well, that lead time is kind of can be kind of a problem because right if we run into a a, a delay for of some sort, we've just done a bunch of extra work for nothing, which is a bummer. Okay, but what we can do is we can actually in this decoding unit we can add another functionality to it and that allows us to know if we have to fetch something from main memory because if we if we want if we if we need to do that and bring that into cache then we can do that well while, while it's waiting in the queue so that helps us speed things up, right? Because one, what's the th what's the main thing that slows us down is anytime we need to fetch from memory, that slows down the processor by a lot because it just sits there waiting, and we know that those retrieval times are much higher than the processor can run a clock cycle. So it might take a hundred clock cycles. Well, if we're a hundred in front of the so that the queue is a hundred in front of as soon as we notice that then we can put something on that and so that by the time that that piece of uh, that that instruction gets to the point where it's going to get executed the uh, the memory is already there it's already been moved to, into cache so that's the the added bonus right is that we would never have to stop for that so that's that's pretty useful okay Oh, okay. So there's another style that we can use, and that's the VLIW style. And this is very long instruction word. Typically, Four to eight normal instructions. Oops, I don't want that. Typically, each very long instruction word contains four to eight actual instructions. So it's a different paradigm. It's a different way of doing things because what we can do is we can read in all four of them or all eight of them or however many it is, and we read them in at the same time. These are... So, in, right, instead of doing this instruction instruction fetch unit. We don't have to do that because we're just going to combine all of them. Oh, here's the difference. This is driven by a special compiler. So we can take a special compiler that uses this paradigm and, and the, the cool part is is that if something can't be done uh, simultaneously it can actually move it to a spot so that there's no conflicts. So, or, or potentially at least, so that we can do some, we can do as much as we can simultaneously, but then we might have one instruction that can't be done simultaneously with others in of its ilk, but those are not in there. So, and, and so the compiler hangs onto it and does it. There's a controversy. In fact, we could get into um, a war where we all have to sharpen our pencils and uh, and and you know, throw erasers at each other or something. I don't know uh, what what a computer science. How do they? How do computer scientists have have uh, arguments in a physical way? I don't think they do. Uh, and metaphorically, I'm not talking about really doing that. But uh, it can get pretty heated sometimes. People can get pretty upset about different things. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting. So, uh, like one of the things I'm a real big proponent of is paired programming, but the, the vast majority of, not necessarily computer scientists are, are, aren't for that, but 
the vast majority of even uh, professors aren't aren't for that. And so, but I'm I'm a huge believer in it. I think it's a it's a great thing, um, and I think that's one of the problems with the online any kind of an online class is it doesn't have paired programming in it. Because I think one of the best skills you can learn, the, one of the very very best skills you can learn, is how to communicate with other computer scientists. Honestly, actually, other people. So being able to communicate with other people is is a is a great thing. Whether you're a computer scientist or a, or a car salesman, or you build roads on a construction crew, doesn't matter. Uh, or you're a farmer. Uh, you know you're going to be more successful if you can communicate better. That's just the way it is. So um, that can be helpful, and it's and it can be in helpful in your private life too, or not necessarily in your professional life only. Right, the better communicator you are, you're more likely to have uh, better relationships with your significant other. So that's that's a good thing too. So the and and the same thing with with any children that you may or may not, or the I guess you can't if you don't have them, you can't communicate with them. So, uh, but any children that would that also helps as well. But any kind of relationship that you have with your parents even. So. Uh, Uh, okay, yeah, special compiler. Anyways, so there, there is a controversy between Superscala and VLIW, right, because this uses a compiler. And it, and because it knows things ahead of time, it can, it can try to customize things to speed things up as much as possibly, as it possibly can. Where a Superscaler will, will actually try to execute them, but then since it can't, it will notice that it can't, and then that means it'll cause these delays. So it, it, it's just a different way of doing things. Um, the the VLIW uh, also potentially isn't as portable uh, because depending on the computer that you're going to switch it to, right? you might run into Big Indian versus Little Indian uh, problems. And, and that would definitely be a problem on, uh, from f from this, right? If you've got the compiled code that you're going to try to share with other people. All right, so then the next one. Vector processors. Supercomputers. So this is a heavily... pipeline single input multiple data remember from our taxonomy right single input means that we're going to do one instruction at a time but we have multiple data so we can handle multiple instructions simultaneously so each processor is going to do one but each Uh, but we can have multiple processors. Basically, that's kind of the way we think about it. So let me define what a vector is. It's a fixed length one dimensional array of values. So if you know what an array of values is, right, that's basically what it is. The, the difference is it's, it's, it's forced to be uh, one-dimensional. So it can, you can't have an array of arrays or a vector of vectors. You can't do that. It's not possible. <clears throat> so incidentally, in the language C, they actually make use of vectors. Uh, they have vectors as well as arrays, so they have both. Um, whereas in Python, they all get mashed together into lists. So, that that just just understand, um, it, it's it's a collection of things that is one dimensional. That's just the simplest way to talk about. It. But, uh, so this is this is where I'm going to talk about where this is used. Used in 
weather forecasting. So, okay, it's used anytime we have a large selection. I say large, it depends, right? I mean, it might be might mean uh, 10, it might mean 100, it might mean a 1,000, it might mean a million. Uh, but if we're going to do some kind of processing on some large vector, right, weather, so, right, we can do this with weather forecasting. They use it in weather forecasting because they have a lot of data to crunch. Medical diagnosis. And the one I'm the most familiar with. Image processing. So I think all of us understand or know, right, that an image is made up of a bunch of pixels. And each of those pixels has data that tells the computer what color to create it in. But for the most part, right, there is an awful lot of pixels in an image, right? So when you think about it, each pixel is stored in, it depends on the, the, the coding system that, that is used or how, saturate, how, how, how many different colors you've got. But basically, you can do, I, I think it's one byte per, or three, I'm sorry, three bytes per pixel. Now, I could be wrong on that. It might be a little different than that. Depends. But the basic way to think about it. Yeah, because in two hex, hex codes. So yes, that'd be one byte. And so it's either three or four, depending on the style that you use for most things. So however many pixels are in the picture, right? So if it's four billion, four million, sorry, billion would be a lot. Four million, 10 million, 20 million, whatever. However many megapixels, right? That'd be me millions of pixels. Uh, if we're going to do some kind of image processing, so... Uh, an example of, well, you guys are probably f pretty familiar with that, right? We could add things on top of it, you know, like, like, like Snapchat does or other things do as well. But instead of that, if we, if we're, if we had a picture that was particularly blurry and we wanted to try to make it less blurry, we could certainly do that. But the thing is, is we would do the same exact process over every single pixel. So what we can do is we can use a vector processor to do this because we're going to do all of them at the same time, essentially. Although we might not have enough processors to do that. So we can go through the same process on 100 processors. And then we can do the next chunk of them and the next chunk of them because each one is independent. Each pixel is processed independently. So let me give you an example. I'm going to break away from this and, and give you guys an example. Uh, let's just make a new one, actually, because I think I can do it just as easily in type. Okay. All right. So this, this might be familiar to you. It might not be. For I do... Vector length, and I don't want that I to be capitalized. Good. V3, or vector 3, in position I, gets vector 1 in position I plus vector 2 in position I. So this would be 
I want to take, if I've got two vectors and I want to add them together in each corresponding position, that's what this is going to do. This is in the normal way. Now let's do it with the vector processing unit. VL or VL. Yeah. VDL. V1, R1. I'll talk about how each one of these Okay. I'll make this. This is normal. This is a vector processor. Okay, so let me talk about what each one of these things does. So the first one says load date, load, LD, V, load a vector, it, named vector one. So whatever is vector one, and load that. So somewhere else in the code, I'm going to have to disassociate V1, V2, and V3 and give those memory locations or ranges, as it were. Okay, so we're going to load one into a special vector processor into a special registry. This registry holds a single vector, however much that is. And then L2 brings in another vector into another special vector registry for for uh, it called R2 and then I'm going to add the two vectors together store uh, I'm gonna store it into V3 the addition of V1 and V2 and then at the end I'm going to store the vector in V3 and store that into V or sorry, in R3, into the register 3, and store that into V3. So this is uh, so if we look at this and just kind of see how long it would take, this only takes four cycles. And the first one, that one takes because because that v3 sub i equals that that this line here this 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 line here is it's probably multiple different steps uh, i'm going to say 1 2 3 4 at least but maybe 5 depending on how we can use the accumulator um, yep i i would 1 2 three, four, uh, five, six maybe. I think actually probably five or six. Depends on how, how, how it gets implemented. But then that's six times the length of the vector. Well, here's the thing. The vector could be 100 characters long or 100 values long. Uh, and so in that's that's how we can process so much that's how supercomputers get to process so much information at the same time and so that's why they're supercomputers and why they're so fast 
Plus, they're usually cooled by liquid nitrogen. That always helps. All right, so now let me talk about connected networks. And I'm going to go back to drawing again. Oh. Because I'm going to have to draw some pictures. Pictures are good. Pictures are fun, right? All right, so in connected networks, so here's, here's the thing that gets kind of interesting, is that we can talk about connecting process, processors, and it can be multi-level, so we could connect four processors together in, in, one to, in one way, and so I'm going to talk about ways we can connect things. Uh, I think I have uh, like eight different ways. And, and there are more, uh, but, but these are the kind of the main ways. So each, uh, okay, so, and that, but then, and then each of these clusters of, of processors, we could connect in a different way. So what we're going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, these are connected networks or distributed networks. So what I want to talk about is topologies. So topology is the study of, wait, did I have that up? Um, the mathematical study of the properties that are preserved through, no, 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 no. The way in which constituent parts are interrelated or arranged. So topology is how things are arranged. So we could say uh, in baseball, right, the topology of the players in a baseball, the, on the baseball field, right? The first baseman is near first base or about right here, and then the left fielder is in in left field, right? So we can we could, that we could talk about that, and then we could that that's that would be an example of topology as well. Or you could do football players, or you could do um, dancers, uh, dancers in a, a choreographed dance. You could do uh, band members in a marching band. Uh, any of those kinds of things. Okay, so, all right, let me get back here and get this real scrolled down a little bit. Right. Get it back. Okay, so the first one is complete. And so, let me do five. These are dots. Each of those dots represents a computer. Kind of looks like a star in this case. Oh, I'm not done. Oh, I already had one there, that last. That last bit. That's all right. I'll redraw it. It's actually a pentagram. Um, in, in graph theory, we would call this a K5, but that's. Uh, I did a pentagram, so it's off. That's off long, so it's all right. Hopefully. So this is a complete, and this is where every single node is connected to every other node. Okay. 
The next one is a star. Put one in the middle. One, two, three, four, five. So this is a star. So in a star, there's outer ones and then there's an inner one. So all of them are connected to the main inner one, except for the inner one, which is connected to all the others. Linear. That's real simple. So linear is could be potentially useful. Uh, we don't do it this way anymore, but in the olden days they connected networks this way. So they would just run a cable from one computer to the next computer, and it's really useful if you've got a bunch of uh, offices that are right next to each other. Because you just run a cable from one office to the next office to the next office to the next office. It's not terribly efficient. ring. So the next one is a ring. So it's almost exactly the same as linear, except for I'm going to draw them a little differently. So if this was linear, it would just be like this. That's still linear. Now a ring just closes a loop. So they're in a in a big pattern, and they just go around one to the next to the next to the next. When you get to the last one, then you go back to the first one, and you connect them that way. A mesh. Mesh a little bit more complex. Um, So to mesh, we think about this in two dimensions. So each one is connected like this. So let me eh, I bet you oh I did. Okay. I'm gonna copy that. Paste that down here, and then I'm going to add something more to it. Ah, okay, well, it didn't get all of them. That's okay. So here's the mat, different color. I'm going to switch to blue. Not that these are special, but I'm just going to use the blue to denote, so that way it doesn't get confused with the red. All these connections are the same, so there, there's no difference in between them. Just makes it a little bit easier for visibility. So each of the each of well, this one is connected. What one? One, two, three, four times. This is connected four times. This is connected four times. They're all looks like they're all connected four times. In this one, some of them are connected. This one's connected four times, but this one's connected two. So it's a little different there. All right. So then a tree. Oops. Uh, there actually, there's lots of different ways to connect trees, uh, but this is this is probably the most basic one. And this is called a binary tree. Uh, you don't need to know that necessarily yet, but you might need to know that someday. So this is a tree um, in that there's a central root node, and then that one connects down the line, and then each one of these would potentially split as well. And so 
what that does is it connects everyone as closely as possible to our root node. And in this case, it's there's only two here. We could have three or four or five, and it would still be a tree. So technically, a star is actually a tree. Although a star is not allowed to have more. You can't branch off of this one on a star. In a tree, you can. The nodes can branch off. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, the last one is the most interesting of all of them, and probably the best one as well, and that's a hypercube. Okay, so let me show you what a, how a hypercube works, uh, and that's so okay. So all right, so this is a hypercube of one. There's h one, and then. I can do another one here. This is a one dimensional. So then what I did is I copied this to here and then I connected every single one of these to the corresponding one here. Okay? Okay, now I'll show you how this works. So now if I want to get another layer, I'm going to go ahead and copy that. I'm going to paste it. Uh, nope, I'm going to paste it. Undo that. There we go. Copy that. Go over here. Paste it. I'm going to bring it up here. And I'm going to connect the corresponding nodes. So it's a box. Well, that looks, looks, looks a heck of a lot like a ring or a mesh. It's not interesting yet. Now we're about to get interesting. This is where it gets interesting. All right, I'm going to switch colors again, but these connections don't matter. So, or the colors don't matter. It's just to sort of for visibility. All right, so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to connect corresponding nodes. So this one, its copy was there, and then this one goes over here, and then this one to there, and this one to there. If I draw this one a little bit better, or differently, I can make it look like a cube, like a three-dimensional cube. But I'm not going to do that, because it makes it harder to then do this. that. Go down here, paste this in. There we go. Now I'm going to draw two corresponding nodes. There we go. There we go. There we go. And I can continue doing this. Oops. Infinitely. Although at at this point, I'm going to quit because it gets really hard to see. And plus, I'm out of colors. So here's the cool thing. If you want to go from one node or one of these processors or computers to another one, what's the maximum distance they can be apart? In this, which is called an H4. Sorry, is it H4? H5. This is an H5. No, no, I'm sorry. The first one I showed you was an H0. One dot is an H0. This is an H4. Maximum distance. The maximum distance is 4, because it's an H4. And if it's, if you're not crossing, if you're only using, say if you're only using red lines, then it would be 2 would be the farthest jump. So if we just looked at red and blue lines, right? So we look at any of these top ones here. 
So we say, well, what's the farthest away? The farthest away is this one right here. Well, there's nothing that connects it. So I can either go into our corresponding, at any point I can go to the corresponding one in the other graph. So I could either do that first or second or right or second here or third there. But then but then I do have to travel down two red lines. In a uh, when we go to the fourth dimension, then the farthest would be from here to here, or something symmetrically the same. And the, the fastest way to get there would be, say, uh, a blue, a green, and then two reds, however it is. But that's what I have to do. I have to do a blue, a green, and two reds. And if I would have thought ahead just a little bit, I would have actually done the sideways ones here in a different color because that was actually drawn between two two graphs itself, right? We had that we had that two part linear graph, then I copied it over here and then I connected them. So if I had done that in a different color, then it would be really easy to see that that you you would have to do a four way jump, right? And you'd have to just do one of every single of the four colors. And that each of the nodes then would be connected only to one line of each color. And you could do them in any order, but that's how you would get there. Okay, so there's one more, and that's the bus network. Or the bus topology. I guess we're talking about topologies. Oops, I don't need to adjust that. No, get rid of the whole thing. So I'm just going to call it the bus. Bus. So that's our trunk line, like this. Call this our bus. And I'm only drawing them like this to make it a little easier to see. There's no significance to where these all line up. They just, everybody connects to the bus and the bus is just a big freeway. <laughs> Networks are not usually set up like any of these. <laughs> there are this huge combination of things. So a star actually is a perfect example of a network. If I have a router, or a switch, and this would be the switch in the middle, and then all the devices connected to it are there, like that. And that includes maybe potentially a wireless connection. This, uh, an example of this, actually there's something called Hadoop. Um, It's a way to do peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Uh, let's say we have let's say we have pictures. Just that, just as an example, I want to share a picture with with uh, whoever wants wants it. So then, what will happen is, and so we all say we have all these phones that are connected to a network, or not even a network. They, they can just connect, right? Because phones can connect by Bluetooth or or just by wireless with each other, and so. Uh, what, well, actually, this is th this is something actually that used something like this. Let me let me explain this. In a natural disaster like the one that happened in in Florida recently, where they had the hurricane, uh, somebody had been trying to develop a system using a Hadoop style system, where it was peer to peer. So what you would do is if you needed to send out a text, you want to be able to send a text message. You probably can't do a phone call through this because it would use too much energy, but you would send out text messages. So all the people who wanted to could sign up for this service, download this app, and they could send messages Hadoop style. So what happens is two cell phones can't be very far apart, right? Because they don't have the signal strength, but they, they, you know, they could be maybe a, a hundred feet from each other. And so what you can do, especially in large metropolitan areas, hopefully all the people are gone so they don't get hurt. Uh, right, but when they start coming back, all these people can sign up for it. And even though there's no towers that exist, what can happen is that can, that text message can jump from phone to phone to phone to phone to phone to phone. 
until it gets close. Now that's not exactly what a complete network would be like, but anybody who's within range, you would be able to be connected to. Uh, turns out, hasn't been pro a problem because they were able to set up those towers pretty dang quickly, which is <laughs> amazing to me. So, all right, that's enough on that. Uh, actually, it looks like I might not. Uh, no, it depends how much more I want to talk about here. I could. There's some of this I could. I could easily probably skip, and it wouldn't be that big of a deal. So, um, we can also talk about. Uh, We can talk about another connection style. Let me. Uh, so there's another kind of network called a switching network. And this is actually similar to the way, the old way that the telephones used to work. And so. Actually, it's a different. It's a it's a better a better way to show you a different way. Actually, another think about it. Oh yeah. Okay. So let's say we have main memory one, two, three, and four, and CPU one, two, two three and four. So what we're gonna do is just gonna draw lines out like this. And where two of these lines cross or intersect, there's a switch. I can put that there like this. This is a good way to kind of think about it. Um, and so what happens is, is that we would, let's say, if we want three to connect to four here, we would make this a connection. So that we these switches can either be on or off. And by normally they're off. And so what will happen then is the data will travel down this line and these are all going to stay closed. So it's going to travel down this line until it gets to that switch. Aha, this is close. Uh, it's it's uh, closed or, yeah, or open, sorry. Open, closed, ow. Open is when it's not connected, right? So these are open, this one's closed. So then it'll start going down this and it'll go down and get to the memory. And, and so then we could also find another one that's eligible. Let's say maybe this one would be on and maybe this one and then this one here. But it, we would, you would never want to have two that are on at the, you know, at the same time on the same memory, right? So at least most of the time. Okay. So this is, these, this is called a switching network. It's either open or closed. That's kind of a neat way to, do, to talk about that. And that actually works really well for, for things like CPU and, a, and a, say, a bunch of RAM. So, right, you can assign that, this RAM here to there. And maybe two needs to get access to four at, at some point, so then it has to wait till three is done. Okay. Uh, next, next thing. Oh, that's, and that's the crossbar switches. Oh, sorry. These are crossbars up here. And the reason why they're called crossbars is only, you can only connect two things with them. Right? It's either open or closed. So now this is not a two crossbar. This is a two by two switch. Two 
two by two. Switch. So this is two input and two output. So here's that switch. Okay, now what I want to do, because there's f different f four different states that this switch can be in. Broadcast and lower broadcast. Through. Let's do red again. Through is like this, the connections are just straight across. Cross. They just cross over each other. Upper broadcast. The upper one broadcasts to both. So it goes out to both. And then lower broadcast, exactly the same thing, except for the lower one is broadcasting both ways. And that's it. That's all different four ways. And so we can actually set up um, a network like this. Let's set up that network. CPU one, two, three, four. Main memory one, two, three, Four. So what happens is we put we're going to put these two by two switches in here. We're going to put two here, and then we're going to put two more here. And the reason is is we only have two inputs here, right? We have two outputs here. So we would, uh, let's go ahead and put those in. uppers and lowers and here we're going to do things just a little bit different because if we did it the same way right we just did it like this it would be difficult to kind of uh, or it's more a little bit more difficult to deal with we're going to crisscross those here and then here we'll do this And here's the interesting part, right? If this leaves the upper, it goes into the upper. This leaves the lower, it came from the upper, so it goes into the upper. So both of the outputs from this one go into the upper slot. So in this case, we know where it came from. In this case also, if you look at both of these two, from the lower of the two switches, they go into the lower slot as well. And so, and the same thing could be here, right? Is that we could say it in, in reverse. So the upper spots here comes from the upper position in both places. And the, uh, this is the lower of the two. And so this goes in, comes from the lower of the two in each of these. That's the same exact thing, just differently said. Uh, by the way, this is called a two stage. Omega.
You don't have to worry about that. But uh, necessary, you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about what this is called. So here's the thing, right? There are computer scientists who sit around actually thinking very, very deeply about different ways to do this more, do, to, right, to do topologies. And so it's, it's, a, it's a really well-defined system. Uh, well, the, it's well-defined um, discipline or sub-discipline in computer science. So it's, it's uh, there's just a ton of information out there. Uh, and, and they're still looking for better ways to do things and more elaborate ways to do things, especially as we become more and more parallelized in the future. Okay, or distributed even. All right, both of those things are true. All right, so I'm gonna talk about two more things um, and then we'll be done because we're all just about out of time. So, and the first one is public resource computing, and I touched on that a little bit last time. SETI at home, um, and if we had time, I'd go again. I'd go out and look at it uh, because I think it's still active, uh, or at least there's a site there. Uh, but we're not going to worry about that. So, the public resource computing would be where people check in to the system, and then the system makes use of your computer for uh, for their for whatever they're working on. Oh, and then the next one is really a neat idea, and that's ubiquitous. Oh, geez, what happened here? This is the word for the day. Oh, this is spelled wrong. Ubiquitous. Really cool thing. When I there's a, a test that you take before you get into grad school. I learned this. I learned this by the way in computer science in this class, uh, in a in a class similar to this one. Um, and pretty sure that's correct. I, I think so. Uh, uh, no, no. I think I learned it in networking class. Anyways, uh, ubiquitous. Uh, it means everywheres. It means kind of permutating. And so that's another word for ubiquitous network or ubiquitous computing, I'm sorry, is uh, the other word is um, why am I completely drawing a blank now? Ubiquitous pervasive. So that pervasive is a pretty simple. So it's kind of like it exists everywhere. So we could say that Air is ubiquitous. Or you could even say something like there was an air, uh, there was a feeling of, there, there was a ubiquitous feeling of spring in town. Right? It means that everyone had this feeling of spring. This probably isn't true, but it makes for a really nice sentence. Uh, so here's the cool thing about ubiquitous. It So let it. What it means is, is that there's, there's computers everywhere. And, and if we think about it even now, right, it used to be, you know, even 10 years ago, I could ask people how many computers were in their home, including a cell phone and the laptop and, the, and a tablet and all that kind of stuff. And they can actually list them out. If I had to do that now, it'd be much more difficult, right? Because you might have a, a you know, your fridge might your refrigerator might be on the network. Um, in fact, actually, there's some kind of cool things with that, right? You, you can have a camera on the inside of your fridge and so and an app on your phone so that at the end, uh, or when you're at the grocery store, you can look, hey, did, did we run out of bacon? And so you can look. So right now, you just have to throw another one. If you don't have a smart fridge, right? You, you can't look in the fridge. It just... Uh, you just have to say, well, throw another thing of bacon. Well, bacon's always good, right? So it's okay. So, uh, or, or am I out of eggs or almost out of milk? Those kinds of things. All right. So here's the interesting thing about the idea with ubiquitous computing is that the idea of computing will fade into the background because you won't have to ask for things. So let's, let's just, let's just, I'm just going to, I'm going to use kind of the, the food option because I've talked about a fridge already. So as you use items out of the fridge, 
the refrigerator itself or maybe even your cupboards they all have cameras in them and so it knows how much stuff you have and it knows how much you want to have on stock and so what it'll do is it will order those things for you to either go pick up or whatever and so you'll have your store that you're going to go to and so it might be shipped to you or you might go there and so you would just set up a certain time your your phone would remind you or some other device would remind you that it's time to go go pick up your groceries at seven o'clock tonight or ten o'clock tonight or whatever time it is that you go and so you would just go to the place where they you pick it up you wouldn't have to order it. They would compile everything, put it in the cart for you. You've got your credit card on file. They bill you for it. You just go there and you pick it up and put it in your car and drive it home. So you don't have to think about things. They just, just automatically get done for you. That's pretty cool. So that's the idea of, of ubiquitous computing is that when you had a, even if you didn't have cameras everywhere, right? When you had a piece of toast and you just had one, right, it, the, the toaster would be able to tell the piece of software that's ordering your groceries for you that you had one piece of toast. So it doesn't have to go on that kind, same kind of subscription system which we have now, which is automatic every week or every month or whatever it is. So... Um, that's the idea of ubiquitous computing is that the computer, all the computers in your life would be able to communicate with each other and then just do what you wanted them to do. So, all right, I think that's everything I've got. And, uh, so I'm going to call that the end of it and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys again next week. Um, and again, uh, yeah, next week is a full week, right? Uh, next two weeks are full weeks, so, um, and we'll start we'll start working on the Marie uh, stuff at the end of next week. Yeah, a and my thinking is that I will give you some extra time on the on the pro projects, so I'll I'll create the project uh, as soon as I can, and it'll be due uh, at at the time and we'll talk about how that plays out Ooh, it's gonna be due over thanksgiving <laughs> well I'll, I'll see uh, so uh, maybe i'll try to see if i can't make it create it um this week so that you know we can we'll make it due on that friday of thanksgiving the day after thanksgiving although you certainly can turn it in early um in fact i would invite you please turn it in early so you're not working on it Unless you want an excuse to get away from your family over the over the uh, Thanksgiving break, uh, maybe that's a oh man, mom and dad, I, I can't I can't come home for Thanksgiving. Of course, you should go home for Thanksgiving at least to get a meal out of the deal, right? Uh, but you know you you don't want to deal with your younger brothers and sisters or whatever, so you say, well, you know I got to work on my project, so I can't I can't stay too long. So maybe I'll give you guys that gift, <clears throat> or you can do it early. It's up to you. Okay, that's it. I will talk to you all next week and I look forward to